morning and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is Thermocouple Vacuum Gauges, Operation Best Practices in Troubleshooting. Doug Baker, Hastings will be presenting today. We will be taking questions throughout the webinar, so feel free to submit them throughout. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Doug. Okay, thanks Shelley. Hello and welcome to today's webinar entitled Thermocouple Vacuum Gauges, Operation, Best Practices, and Troubleshooting. Today's webinar runs just over 20 minutes, and we'll have time at the end for questions, as Shelley mentioned. The webinar is being recorded, and the presentation will be posted on our website and on, also on our YouTube channel. Um, here we go. My name is Doug Baker, and I'm the Director of Sales here at Teledyne Hastings in Hampton, Virginia. So let's get started. All right. In today's webinar, we're going to start by describing the operation of thermocouple vacuum gauges, uh, specifically how these instruments measure vacuum. We will then have a few words on installation, and then we'll move into the different types of meters or controllers that could be used with our thermocouple gauge tubes. Once we have our readout, cable, and gauge tube, we can talk about accuracy and repeatability. We'll also touch on the use of thermocouple gauge tubes with gases other than air or nitrogen, and we will finish by going through some troubleshooting steps if you ever experience a problem. Now there are different types of thermocouple gauge tubes with different configurations of heater wires and junctions, but we're going to focus our attention on our DB6 series. As you can see in the diagram shown above the gauge tube, there are three thermocouples in a DB6 gauge tube, A, B, and C. Before I go any further, let's quickly talk about a thermocouple. A thermocouple is two dissimilar metals brought together. When you have a thermocouple junction, there will be a small voltage, and this voltage is a function of temperature. So by carefully selecting the materials in the thermocouple junction and measuring the millivolt output, you can determine the temperature of the thermocouple junction. Okay, so two of the thermocouples, A and B, are heated. They get to about 300 C in high vacuum. This in turn generates a DC voltage, which is measured at pin 7. The thermoconductivity of the gas surrounding the thermocouples, which is related to the pressure, affects the DC voltage they generate. So now let's look at gas molecules in the gauge tube itself. At one millitor, there are approximately 3 times 10 to the 13th molecules of air per cubic centimeter. And these are moving at an average speed on the order of half a kilometer per second. So gas molecules are moving in and out of the gauge tube, and some of these will collide with the wires in the gauge tube and carry away thermal energy. Of course, at higher pressures, there are going to be more of these collisions, which means more thermal energy transfer, and the DC output will be lower. At low pressures, there are fewer collisions, less thermal energy transfer, which means a higher temperature and a higher output of the tube. So, by measuring the thermal conduction rate of the gas, we're getting an indirect measurement of the pressure in our vacuum system. So, you can see the two extremes there on that chart. On the, on the far left, you can see in high vacuum, that's where we get the highest millivolt output. And at high pressures, on the far right of the curve, that's where you get the lowest output. And before we move on to talk about installation, I want to briefly touch on the term indirect gauge, which you may have heard me say a second ago. If you recall the definition of pressure, it is simply force per unit area. Now, if you look at the diagram of a classic mercury manometer, shown there at the left, uh, mercury manometers are direct gauges. They indicate pressure by showing the force involved to create the mercury column. Direct gauges are independent of the gas species being used. They detect the forces on some surface. Examples are shown in the right-hand column, uh, like a Bordon tube there shown, uh, shown on the right, those sort of dial indicators, piezo crystals, and of course capacitive manometers are all um, types of uh, different direct gauges. Indirect gauges measure some property of a gas which changes with pressure. In addition to thermocouple gauges, you have hot filament ionization gauges, cold gathode gauges, and spinning rotor gauges. These are all examples of indirect gauges. Now the point of all this is that the output of a thermocouple gauge 
for a given pressure depends on the type of gas being used. Now, for many users uh, pumping air out of their systems, this does not ever really come up. But if an application requires backfilling with a different type of gas, then the display of an indirect gauge set up for air and nitrogen will not be the same as a direct gauge. Okay, so let's move on to installation. First, a good practice is to install the gauge tube with the port facing down. That's not essential, uh, but it will reduce the likelihood of any oil or some particulates making their way into the tube. Now, when installing an eighth inch NPT tube, you want to use a good sealant. And I want to thank uh, Swagelock for giving me uh, permission to borrow their diagram showing the NPT system. Now, according to the uh, tube fitters manual from Swagelock, the uh, NPT tapered pipe threads are designed to seal between the flanks of the threads. You know, the tapered pipe threads work by an interference fit. And for this reason, a good thread sealant is always needed to fill in the gaps between the crests and the roots. A sealant, such as uh, a PTFE tape, will fill the, uh, fill the voids uh, between the uh, sealant surfaces. So you can do this by using uh, PTFE tape, or there's also this stuff called SWAC, or some users will use uh, high vacuum uh, epoxy. For ultra clean systems, many users choose the VCR version of our gauge tubes. Of course, uh, another fast and reliable seal can be made with uh, KF flanged versions. Uh, also not shown are metal sealed uh, conflat flanges for ultra high vacuum systems. And I want to mention that Teledyne has certified welders here, so if you have some other fitting that you want to put on a gauge tube, uh, contact us and uh, we could probably handle it. So now let's quickly look at the different meters that are available for our thermocouple gauge tubes. Digital meters like the DCVT and HPM456 shown there uh, have microprocessors and they can give accurate readings. In addition, the DCVT and DAVC vacuum instruments give linearized uh, output. So they take that S-shaped curve I showed earlier and will actually generate a um, 0 to 5, 0 to 1, or 0 to 10 volt linear output or 0 to 20 milliamp or 4 to 20 milliamp uh, output. Also, RS-232 and RS-45 enabled devices make it easy to interface to a PC or a PLC. And we also offer control relays which trigger off a pressure set point, and these are great for process control. The HPM456, shown there in the middle, is a portable battery-operated digital uh, device uh, for use with either the DV4, DV5, and DV6 series. And there at the bottom, I've also shown the uh, analog gauges, and these are the classic uh, meter movements where the needle gives a nice indication of the rate of change of the pressure. And these can also be provided with uh, control relays. Now, one more word about digital gauges. We program the output curve, whether it's the DV4, DV5, or DV6, that, it, that is at the output of the function pressure of the instrument software. So new DV6 tubes have nearly identical output characteristics. Uh, we always expect, we always get uh, in high vacuum 10 millivolts plus or minus 0.3 millivolt output. In fact, the curve shown to the left is not one gauge tube's output, but it's in fact five tubes laid on top of each other. And this allows us to do a couple of things. First, our calibrated vacuum instrument with a DV6 can have an uncertainty better than plus or minus 15% of reading plus one millitor. There are, of course, similar accuracy statements for our DV4 and DV5 series. And second, the other thing that we get is because every Hastings DV6 gives the same output, the user's process control parameters will be repeatable from system to system. All the gauge tubes behave the same way. And if you want to learn more about the difference between Teledyne Hastings gauge tubes and others that are on the market, uh, you can visit uh, HastingsGauge.com and get an inside look at the different gauge tubes out there. One other topic we want to touch on is the use of thermocouple gauges with gases other than air or nitrogen. Now, I mentioned earlier that thermocouple gauges are indirect gauges, so the output for a given pressure will be different for various gases. And let's take a look at, at one example. Uh, we'll take a look at argon.
If you're using argon, the indicated pressure that you're going to get on a thermocouple gauge tube is going to be lower. So if the gauge is calibrated for nitrogen, the actual pressure, as measured by a direct gauge, would be much, much higher. So that's something to be aware of when you're, when you're using different gases. And if you ever have any questions about the use of thermocouple gauge tubes and different gases, feel free to contact us, and, and we'll let you know um, how the conversion goes. Uh, we also have uh, combo, gauge, combo gauges that are available. Uh, what we do there is we combine a direct gauge with an indirect gauge, like in the 2002 shown there. So direct gauges, the direct gauge portion measures the high pressures, whereas the indirect gauge measures the low pressures. Uh, these, of course, are a little more expensive, but it eliminates the, at the high end, eliminates the um, uh, having to worry about different gas uh, use. One more thing I want to talk about is the cabling of thermocouple gauge tubes. Our standard uh, cables can run uh, anywhere, you know, 0 to 8 foot, uh, 0 to 10, uh, 25, and we can do standard cables up to 100 foot. Uh, we do have some customers that have built cables up to 250, 250 feet uh, with modifications. Uh, but if you are using a very long uh, cable length, I'd say anything over 25 foot, you may want to use a reference tube uh, to set up the instrument. And we'll talk more about reference tubes uh, in a few minutes. Okay, so let's get into the troubleshooting section, uh, if you ever need to take a look at that, or uh, should be subtitled, What to do when the vacuum pressure reading isn't what we think it should be. And what we're going to do is we're going to break, break this down into a, a couple of different uh, trees here. And first, we're going to take a look at uh, whether our problem is with the system or whether the problem is with the uh, vacuum gauge. So first, let's, let's take a look at the sort of things that, that can happen with the vacuum system. Well, the first thing, obviously, is you can, you can have a leak, all right? Um, and one of the things that you can do to sort of determine if you have a leak is, uh, obviously, if you have a helium leak detector, you can check it out that way, but a lot of people don't have that luxury. Um, so one thing you could do is use a poor man's leak detector, which is to take some alcohol and spray it around where you suspect the leak might be occurring. And what will happen is, initially, uh, the um, leak might be sealed up by the alcohol, and so you'll see the pressure drop suddenly. And of course, when the alcohol evaporates, you'll see this big burst in pressure. So you'll see the, the indication of the pressure change when you're spraying around with, um, with the alcohol. Of course, another thing you could do is uh, do a rate of rise test. If you, you know your uh, system pretty well, you can close off the gate valve and see how quickly it bleeds up the atmosphere. Another thing that can happen is uh, there may be something wrong with the pump itself, some reason why the pump is not getting down to uh, low enough uh, pressure as, as you're used to experiencing. Uh, this may be caused um, in oil uh, sealed pumps. Uh, maybe the oil needs to be um, changed out. Maybe it's gotten too low. Uh, on turbo systems, it could be that the turbo is drawing too much current and you know, it's not spinning as fast as, as you're expecting. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind. Maybe there's something going on with the pump. And the last thing, uh, system-related, um, are materials outgassing in your uh, system. And I've shown there a chart of some different materials that have really high vapor pressures. Um, so if you have um, uh, material in, in the system with a really high vapor pressure, it might be causing the uh, pressure to be higher than what you would normally ex be expecting. All right, so once we've uh, determined that it's really nothing wrong with the system, the pump's working right, we don't have any leaks, we can take a look at uh, the vacuum instrument itself. And we can break that down into two areas, uh, the one on the right being the electronics, the one on the left uh, being the sensor tube. So let's take a look at uh, the electronics. Well, one of the things we can do is we can take uh, one of our reference tubes and verify that the electronics and the cable are working correctly. All right. So what you do is you, you hook up the reference tube uh, to the uh, vacuum instrument, in, to the cable, and uh, you'll get a reading. And so if you look on the side of a reference tube, uh, you see there in the circle this um, particular reference tube is supposed to read uh, 0.12 Tor. This is a DV16D, that which would be used with our DV4 series of, of instruments. Um, so the reading that you get um, on your 
instrument should be the same as uh, what's marked on the side of a reference tube. So it verifies that the electronics and the cable are working correctly. It doesn't tell you anything about the gauge tube that's hooked to the system. It just verifies that the electronics portion are working correctly. Um, I, I do want to point out that um, the reference tubes are all color-coded. Again, so whether you're using the DV4, DV5, or DV6, those color codes will match the reference tube, the corresponding reference tubes. All right, so once we've determined that it's not the system, it's not the electronics, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the gauge tube itself, the sensor tube. And one of the first things we can do with the sensor tube is uh, check the continuity. So earlier we showed um, the, the uh, insides of the uh, thermocouple gauge tubes, and you see that the thermocouples are attached to uh, pins 3, 5, and 7. So you should be able to read uh, a few ohms if you take your ohm meter if you, and connect to those pins. You should be able to uh, get a few ohms between pins 3, 5, and 7. Uh, how do you know where pins 3, 5, and 7 are? It's simple. So you take the, the gauge tube, and there's a alignment notch, um, and you arrange it so it's at the, the 12 o'clock position, and pin one will be at the one o'clock position. And I have to be careful saying that because it's an octal connector. There are actually eight positions, not 12, uh, but you get the idea. So you start at the one o'clock, and then you count clockwise. You see pins three, five, seven, and eight. Pin eight connects uh, with pins three, five, and seven. Um, so in short, if you had, get an open circuit between any of those uh, pins three, five, seven, uh, you're done. You're going to have to replace. Or you're going to have to replace the tube. Uh, so a continuity check is is one of the first things you can do to determine whether or not a gauge tube is is any good. All right. So the next thing we want to take a look at is uh, contamination of the tube. So what can what can happen is that you can have buildup of material uh, on the on the wires. For example, uh, pump oil. Uh, pump oil that. Uh, can backstream into systems and collect on onto uh, surfaces uh, can become a, a contaminant. And what happens there is that um, oil on the wires is basically a thermal short. It increases the thermal conductivity along the wires. Now that thermal conductivity short is not gas related. So what happens is the uh, material on the wire causes the tube to run a little bit cooler. And if you remember from before, a cooler tube is an indication of a higher pressure. So cooler wires means higher pressure. So that's what will happen is that uh, over time, the gauge tube reading is going gonna, gonna to drift up. All right. Um, now, one thing you can do is if you have one of our OSV uh, dual valve quick disconnects, uh, you can pop in two gauge tubes side by side, an older tube and a new tube. You can pop those valves open and check and see if the um, output is the same. So um, that's probably one of the quickest ways to check to see whether the tube is, is being uh, consistent and still operating correctly. The last thing I'll, I'll mention is uh, we have seen cases where the um, wires are actually etched uh, inside a, a, a gauge tube. There could be some sort of chemical reaction which causes the wires to thin out, and that's going to manifest itself as a long-term long -term drift. Uh, I will point out that we have some familiarity with uh, some of these um, uh, instances, and so contact us if you think that's going on. We do have some special alloys uh, for thermocouple gauge tubes for certain applications. Uh, give us a call. All right, so what, what can you do if, if, you, if you are having a problem with uh, oil getting up onto uh, gauge tubes? Uh, one of the things that uh, we do offer is a, a zeolite molecular sieve filter. Uh, these are excellent for uh, oily systems. That filter is shown there in the upper right-hand uh, corner. Um, if you do uh, use the, the zeolite filter, <clears throat> you might consider putting it on a maintenance schedule where maybe you know, once a year or once every few months uh, you replace the uh, material in the filter or replace the filter itself. So uh, maybe when you replace the oil in your pump, you just go ahead and um, take care of the filter at the same time. And as we uh, wrap up the webinar, I, I do want to mention that uh, we do have uh, various gauge tube select, uh, solutions, uh, some for high temperature, like the DV36 shown there. Uh, that will go up to 150 C um, temperature and can also handle high pressure, uh, pressures up to 400 PSIG. That is a, a, a very rugged tube. Uh, that tube has actually been launched into space, and some of those are now on the International Space Station. So 
you know, Hastings has a, a reputation for uh, reliable and, and rugged uh, gauge tubes. I also wanted to show our, our weatherproof version shown there at the bottom. That's the DD6S. It's got this uh, O-ring uh, sealed cap and lanyard to keep the cap with the gauge tube. Um, and we also have versions of gauge tubes which have amplified output. Uh, what I mean by that is you supply a DC voltage and you're going to get back a, a zero to one volt non-linearized uh, uh, output. So to summarize here, you know, thermocouple gauge tubes are, are very reliable. They're economical. Uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about the repeatability. They're, they're very simple devices. They're no moving parts. So again, very reliable. And of course, uh, they're also very rugged. Uh, if you ever do have a problem with uh, any of our vacuum or flow instruments, uh, you can contact any of our global service centers. Uh, obviously, we've got the uh, uh, service team here at the factory. Uh, in Europe, we have Shell Instruments. In China, uh, Shanghai Jiga. And in South Korea, we have Infrared. And any of them can uh, help you uh, get service on your uh, vacuum instrumentation. I do want to thank you uh, for attending today's, uh, today's webinar. Um, if Again, we're going to uh, post the uh, slides on um, teledyne-hi.com. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can send them into Hastings underscore instruments at teledyne.com. And I'm going to take a look here and see uh, if we have any questions.